Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, as Mike said, my name is Antonio Elias, and um, they've coached me that I should uh, tell you a little bit about my own experience. Let me start by saying that if I could have it my way, and somebody asked me, what do you do for a living? I would love to answer, I'm a systems engineer. The only problem with that is that people usually look at you weirdly and say, what? So I, I, I demote that and say, well, I'm an engineer. Even that is, is an exaggeration because I'm, I'm now at management puke, but I like to believe that I'm still an engineer. And furthermore, I like to believe I'm still a systems engineer. But the fact is that when I went to school, as Mike mentioned, I, I came this close to being a professional student. I just could not get the school out of my blood. Um, I did choose my academic career with a purpose of being a systems engineer. Now, at the time, early 70s, there was no systems engineering curriculum. There was no discipline called systems engineering, even though some of the elements that today are labeled systems engineering with capital S, capital E, started to develop then. So what did I do? I sampled the, the, the Department of Aeronautics and Astronautics at MIT is divided into five main disciplines. The, the classical ones you can imagine, structures, aerodynamics, propulsion, um, uh, guidance and control, and so on. So what I did is I chose my eight years as an undergrad and graduate student at MIT to sample all of the disciplines and become as equally proficient in as many as the, uh, of them as I could. Not that I quite achieved it, but one thing I must say, which is that has helped me more in my professional career than almost anything short of deciding to go to MIT itself. Um, as Mike mentioned, I then joined the faculty for several years until finally they decided I wasn't good enough to be given tenure. And then I got a phone call from a, a younger um, co-student of mine, younger because when he was an undergrad, I was already a grad. But he said that he and a few other colleagues were here in Washington, and they, were, they had started a space company. And of course, that was David Thompson, that was Orbital, and I had the advantage of having not been given tenure, which means you all of a sudden feel like taking more risks. So I joined, I'm terrible with dates, but there's a few I remember, and one of them is September 2nd, 1986 which was the day I joined Dave Thompson and 19 other people. The, the day I joined the company were 20 of us, from Dave Thompson to the receptionist, and then me next to me on the ladder. Well, today, Orbital, I'm not sure how familiar you are, but Orbital is about 4,000 people. Uh, we make about one to one and a half billion dollars a year in business, and we build small launch vehicles, although we're now developing our first medium launch vehicle, uh, a plethora of uh, spacecraft, including one which will run the, with the space station probably late this year or early next year as a cargo resupply. And uh, we have made uh, very large inroads into national security space. Um, if you count the number of satellites and rockets that Orbital produces, and you divide it by a number of employees, you'll find an absurdly high ratio of vehicles and programs per employee. Well, the secret is that that's all that Orbital does. Orbital doesn't have shipyards or CETA support contracts or weapon systems or stuff like that. All we do is space. Now, how did we get there from 20 people, uh, actually three people in a spare bedroom in Dave Thompson's house in Thousand Oaks, California in 1982 to where we are today? Well, one of the uh, elements that achieved the orbital of today was a particular flagship product. And that's the one that I chose today to try and, and give a little bit of body to my, remo my remarks of my personal experience on systems engineering and how it affects both the results, my, my own professionally, as well as the organization that I happen to be working in. Now, one of my punch, let me advance one of my punchlines. I'm also a pilot, very avid pilot. I have an ATP, type ratings, instructor certificate. I love flying. And I find a lot of analogies between the discipline of flying and a lot of the disciplines in engineering, especially systems engineering. There's one flying element 
that I'm going to punch line as perhaps the single most important aspect of systems engineering. In flying, it's called situational awareness, or so sometimes being ahead of the airplane. N knowing or feeling or intuiting what is going to happen, so nothing surprises you. And situational awareness is probably the single most element, uh, important element of systems engineering. Uh, Chris was kind enough to share with me some of the terminology that you've been using in this course. And I think that what I'm going to talk about um, really translates in your vocabulary as, as the alignment element, especially the vision element. So in order to do that, I have to tell you a little bit of what Orbital looked like in 1986. As I mentioned, 20 people. The first product that Orbital produced wasn't even built by Orbital. It was an upper stage for the space shuttle. Those of you who are history buffs will recognize the transfer orbit stage. Only two were built. One actually flew on the shuttle. The other one flew on a Titan III. One was, this one was Mars Observer. The other one was ACT, Advanced Communication Technology Satellite for NASA. But what Orbital did at the time wasn't even technical or, or industrial. It was just a financing. And then they stopped with a small aerospace company that was very hungry and was going to lose their launch vehicle product because the shuttle was going to eliminate all the LBs. That small company was called Martin Marietta. So they were the ones that actually built the transfer of this stage. Then Challenger happened. And with that, the presidential directive that the, the shuttle shall not carry commercial spacecraft anymore. So the need for a commercial uh, cost or commercial price transfer stage to carry commercial spacecraft from the shuttle North Orbit to geosynchronous orbit vanished in the uh, terrible fireball that, that also killed six of our uh, great colleagues. So what to do next? And oddly enough, our first next idea was not a launch vehicle. We never saw ourselves being into launch vehicle. As a matter of fact, there had been many attempts I know if you've noticed, but every seven years, as regular as the cicadas come out of the ground, every seven years, somebody decides that what this country needs is a better 2995 launch vehicle. Some succeed, some don't. But uh, we certainly weren't the first ones. As a matter of fact, we had seen the battlefield of new low-cost launch vehicles litter with corpses, and we didn't want to be one of them. But we had the idea of building a constellation of small let me not call them communication, messaging spacecraft to provide things as remote asset monitoring and so on and so forth. So one of my first jobs as the company chief engineer, 20-person company, remember, was to find uh, avenues to launch uh, 30 or 40, mm, under 100 kilogram, under 50 kilogram spacecraft into Earth orbit. And it turned out that the opportunities for secondary payloads on launches were inexistent. We would need seven big launches that all happened to go to the orbits that we wanted and all would be able to host five or six little satellites. Forget it. We went to see a private company called American Rocket Company, one of those seven-year itch organizations. And oddly enough, instead of welcoming us with open arms as potential customers, they thought we were spies trying to find out their secrets, and they kicked us out of their office. Had they said, oh, please sit down, come here, have a cup of coffee, here's our fine rocket, we would have bought it. Instead, we decided it was time to uh, uh, develop our own small rocket. And that small rocket ended up being Pegasus, that uh, some of you may know. And of course, the unusual aspect of Pegasus is that it is a launch. And here begins the systems engineering saga. Pegasus. Um, my role was the um, kind of chief designer, systems engineer. Uh, there was a program manager, former NASA employee, my name was Bob Lovell. You're too young to have ever met Bob. Um, and then there was Dave Thompson, who was essentially managing the business side, the money side. So what was unusual about this program? First, it was done by a group of people who didn't know anything about launch vehicles. I'm sorry, starting with myself. It was a very small group of people. I have in my office a picture that has about 20 people, so but fewer than half of, of the group here. And that is half of the team that designed, built, 
and flew the first um, three or four Pegasi. Um, we were very short in money, and we didn't have a lot of time. So now, fast forward, and what were the results of that effort? And some were good, some were a little disappointing. On the good side, we have flown since 1990, the date of the first flight, 40, 40, Pegasi. We had a few problems initially, but the last 26 have been 100% successful. So in terms of track record, yeah, 26 in a row, uh, not bad. Um, it, when we tallied up all of the cost of developing the vehicle, and there was a, little bit, a couple of shortcuts that I'll mention, it added up to, in $1990, $42 million. We had initially budgeted 40, so wow, we ended up within 5% of our expected non-recurring budget. On the other hand, we had initially targeted a price, price, not cost, price of six million dollars. The first sale of the Pegasus was close to twelve and a half million dollars. And I won't even mention how much we charge NASA today for a Pegasus because it is ridiculous. So definitely on the recurring cost standpoint, we didn't fare as well as we did on the non-recurring. Also, when we embark on this endeavor, um, we had these incredible hopes for um, uh, how many flights we would fly. I remember a view graph that said, well, we'll start with six the first year and 20 the second year to a steady state of about 35 a year. Well, I just mentioned 40 flights in 22 years. That is reality. So now that, uh, and now of course today, Pegasus is a very small fraction of the business at Orbital, a you know, couple of percent. But Pegasus did something for Orbital, which is in, like the ad for this credit card, this so much, this so much, this priceless. There's a priceless element to what Pegasus did, at least for the company, certainly for me. I wouldn't be as bold enough as to say for the space community or for NASA. For Orbital, it was the flagship product. It was the first product the company did. It proved that the company could do something quite spectacular. What was spectacular about Pegasus? It was developed with private money. It was developed in three years. And it was her launch. Okay, so now let's go back to beginning of systems engineering. Um, I could bore you with a long list of trades that embody the uh, realization of what alternatives we had in the production or the development of this particular product or vehicle. Uh, and all the math that went through it, but I will not do that. Rather, I'll point out to two or three characteristic uh, decisions and what systems engineering with the lowercase s and lowercase e had to do with it. And the first one is air launch. Why air launch? Now this question actually is, is gaining a second life because same as every seven years a small company starts to develop the country's lowest cost launch vehicle. With a certain periodicity, everybody revisits Air Launch and says, wait a minute, if Air Launch works so well for Pegasus, why don't we build a medium launch vehicle, uh, Air Launch, and so on and so forth? Um, the, our initial intent for why Air Launch was as follows. A, mm, for, for those of you who have done a little bit of, of uh, modeling, math modeling of launch vehicles and have observed the uh, significant fixed mass items that any launch vehicle has to have. Let me kind of be blunt and go back to the, the IME on the computer and the batteries that the last stage has to have. Those are relatively size independent. So whereas that tax is trivial and insignificant for an ELV, not that trivial but still not a big deal in a medium launch vehicle, as the vehicle becomes small, it becomes a higher and higher tax. For those of you who are also students of history, look at the Scout launch vehicle. 
what a remarkable invention design that was, did not have a flight control system. How they did it was remarkable, but that was the reason for it. Now, by air launching, uh, you gain a significant number of performance advantages. Uh, oh, where shall I start? Um, look at the pressure losses at sea level. As you know, at sea level, an engine has less thrust. Same engine that would have some thrust at vacuum has less thrust. And that's a product of the exhaust area times the outsider pressure. Which means that you don't see, for the first stages, engines with very large expansion ratio because that big back pressure would kill the thrust. So you reduce your expansion ratio, which reduces your ISP, but it reduces your pressure losses. So there's this kind of egg jiggling systems engineering trade that determines, or maybe just a propulsion disciplinary trade that determines that. Ah, the Pegasus starts its life at 35,000 feet, where the ambient pressure is one fourth sea level. So two things happen. Um, a, the total loss is lower because there's less back pressure. B, you now can get by with much larger expansion ratio than you would at sea level. So the overall specific impulse is higher. Number two, the aircraft is going at a pretty good clip, 770 feet per second. So take whatever delta V you, the rocket had to impart and subtract 770 feet per second. As you know, delta V and size, mass, uh, uh, propellant to use whatever, it's not a linear relationship, it's a logarithmic relationship. So saving those last 770 feet per second are worth a lot more. When you lift off from the ground, you can't go horizontal. You could at the moon, you just clear the hills and you're okay, but on the Earth you have to get out of the atmosphere. So you get all this vertical velocity, which ain't going to help you getting your orbital velocity. So at some point in time, you have to uh, turn, and you're using thrust to rotate your velocity vector. And oh, by the way, all your nice vertical velocity ends up being zero when you inject an orbit. So some people call it turning loss. Well, Pegasus starts pretty horizontal, drops a little bit, and then raises up. So. The flight path angle never deviates uh, from minus um, 5 to plus uh, 30 or 40 or so on and so forth. Against that, you have the weight of the wings, you have the aerodynamic drag of the lift and so on and so forth, but overall, you have about a 17% savings in delta V. When you turn that into payload improvement or mass reduction at this size vehicle, it turns out that you get about twice the payload than you would with, if you took Pegasus, got rid of the fins, you have to add thrust vector control in the first uh, stage, and that's in our systems engineering trade I'm going to mention. You get about half the payload. Now, I have actual physical proof of that because the boosters that we build for the um, uh, missile <coughs> defense agencies, ground base, mid course interceptor, are Pegasus without wings and with the TVC in the first stage. So I know exactly how much payload those puppies would give us if you were to use them as launchers, and it's half the payload. And they're about the same size, mass, cost, and everything. So it is a big deal. Why else? Well, uh, air launch. Well, our thought was that we could get away without a launch range. The thinking went something like this. Put it under the airplane. Fly the airplane 500 miles out to sea. Point in the right azimuth for whatever inclination you want to hit. Push the button. Rocket goes. Never go comes near land, so it doesn't have a flight termination system. Doesn't have a tracking system. Doesn't have anything. Crew flies back home, has tea comfortably in their um, you know backyard that evening, and that's the end of the story. No pad, no rain, no nothing. Well, that didn't turn out quite that way. Because the first thing everybody said is, and remember, this is the days before GPS on board or the rockets. Wait a minute, what if something doesn't go right? Wouldn't you want to track the vehicle? Wouldn't you want telemetry? Oh dear, you're right. So we need range assets, which means now we have to be closer to the range. As a matter of fact, we are going to need a flight termination system. 
and so on and so forth. So the net result was that we did not get away with flying with the range. What we did get away with, though, is a significant reduction in the complexity of going from launch location A to launch location B. Our Pegasus has been launched from the Western Test Range, I can't say Vandenberg Air Force Base because the first six flights overflew Vandenberg Air Force Base, but it was their range assets. Eastern Test Range, uh, yeah, we did use the shuttle landing strip to take uh, off, but by the way, the flight control center on the first Eastern Test Range flight was at Wallops. We have so two. Um, we've flown out of uh, Quash, very near uh, um, uh, inclin equatorial inclinations. By the way, one of our Quash operations is something to behold. Um, you go to Quash a month before our launch, there's nothing there that says Orbital, Pegasus, NASA, nothing. Launch occurs a week later, there's nothing there that says Pegasus Orbital Launch. So from one month before to one week after the launch, that's it. Everything gets flown in. Most of the stuff is flown on our current carrier aircraft. We've launched from Europe, as a matter of fact. I think we have the only space launch to orbit from the territory of a European country. The country is Spain, my ancestry country. And the location is the Canary Islands, which some of you may say, well, is that really Europe? Well, it is European territory. Oh, but Kourou is French territory, too. Anyway, so we've launched from there. And you look at all the places at Pegasus, lots of wallops, one of, being one of them. So five launch locations with zero permanent infrastructure at those launch locations. Interestingly enough, that was not the one of the original mm, uh, objectives of the program. Uh, the negative side is that we are now the proud owners of a Lockheed 1011 that spends most of the year holding down the tarmac at um, Mojave Airport. Um, but the first few launches were done not on that Lockheed 1011, they were done on a um, old NASA B-52, the old uh, Balls 8, one of two B-52s used, used in the X-15 program. And I must say that Orbital as a company, Pegasus as a launch vehicle, and myself owe a debt of gratitude of the former Dryden uh, director, Marty Knudsen, who I'm not sure he's with us still, um, who, when we went to him in 1987 to ask for the use of B-52, could have laughed us out of the place. And instead of that, he said, oh, that's very interesting. Here, let me call a few of my guys. Would you like to tour the aircraft? And the rest is history. But I finagle my way, going back to the situation awareness and the breadth of experience that a systems engineer needs. I finagle my way into being the launch panel operator in B-52. B-52 carried two pilots and the launch panel operator. And I won't tell you exactly the why that I used to do that, but I ended up being the uh, operator through another trade. The trade of when you drop this thing from the aircraft, how long do you wait so that if there's a catastrophic failure at ignition, you don't imperil the aircraft and its crew? And yours truly did that trade, the calculation. I said, and by the way, I'm willing to put my money where my mouth is. I will be on the B-52 exposing myself in case my calculation is wrong. I think that impressed sufficient people to say, oh, okay, let's, let's do it. <laughs> now, since it involved the B-52, and dropping something very big. By the way, Pegasus is the largest thing ever airdropped from any aircraft, period. About 50,000 pounds. Um, there's a famous movie that involves dropping something out of a B-52. Anybody care to, to remember what that movie is? Dr. Strangelove. Dr. Strangelove. Do you remember how Major Kong ends his career? Oops. <laughs> that is April 4th, 1990. We flew on April 5th. Uh, this is the live Pegasus. There's 40,000 pounds of ammonium perchlorate and aluminum under me. If you look carefully, there's an anti static mat under my butt. If you look carefully, I have my flight boots tilted out. I didn't want to touch the vehicle. And the vehicle has been painted, didn't have the decals uh, set up yet. Um, 
again, the lead systems engineer flies on the mission, you know, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. That's our message. Now, after the first six flights, um, NASA decided that they could not, in all honesty, support operational use of this vehicle with the B-52. Today, they probably wouldn't say that, but at the time they did. So we looked around and found a very nice, low-cost, large commercial carrier aircraft that could carry the B-52, and that's a Lockheed 1011. We bought Lockheed 1011 serial number 67 from Air Canada, and um, most large-body aircraft structure have a keelson in the middle of the structure, and the ribs are attached to the keelson as well as other uh, stringers in the longitudinal direction, not the 1011. The 1011 has a dual keel running on both sides of the central line, and it's approximately 48 inches, and right here in the middle of the space between the landing gear wheel welds, there's the hydraulic service center, which is a big room with some plumbing and so on and so forth. Well, let's go back to systems engineering and how this ties in. The motors for Pegasus were a derivative of a technology that Hercules Aerospace developed in the um, uh, late 80s for a project called a small ICBM, sometimes called a rail garrison. This was going to be an ICBM capable of reaching the Evil Empire from a mobile uh, launcher erector, either on large trucks or on railroad cars. For a number of reasons, thank goodness, that program was never required, so it was canceled. But Hercules had developed this very high efficiency, uh, high performance, small solid motor technology. It was a little bit small for our size. So Hercules Aerospace, now part of ATK, developed three 48-inch, uh, two 48-inch motors and a smaller 38-inch motor using that technology. The way the, this 40,000, 50,000 pound vehicle is carried on the aircraft is through four hooks attached to the wing. By the way, why does it have a wing? Another systems engineering trait. Anybody cares to um, speculate why? Pardon me? Why, uh, for takeoff, no. The thing is, you know, the lift uh, of this compared to the lift of the B-52 is peanuts. It's when you draw up how much negative flight path angle. If you just use a rocket thrust to, to um, modify your flight path angle, then um, you, you lose so much energy that you negate a lot of this 17% delta V gain that I mentioned earlier. Not to mention the interesting 45 to 90 degree flight path angle. The wing itself is another systems engineering trade. Most aircraft wings, um, uh, let's see, you're familiar with um, uh, the, the problem, are optimized for a certain Mach number or a range of Mach numbers. Pegasus accelerates from Mach 0.8 to Mach 8 in about 58 seconds. So it doesn't stay at any Mach number more than one. So this is the most pedestrian, basic, uh, supersonic wing one could imagine. Very inefficient, but it does a trick. So, uh, interesting systems engineering trade, uh, and I use this as an example of non-numeric or extra mathematical elements that come in systems engineering. Ideally, the way to carry a vehicle like this is to have a long wheelbase attachment, say a couple of hooks here and a hook rather towards the front, and that's the way the X-15 was carried. What happens when you don't do that? If you only carry it as we ended up doing it from here, the whole rocket droops. And there's a lot of uh, strain energy stored in that drooping vehicle. What happens when you release the hooks? Boing! And the lateral acceleration the spacecraft sees when that happens is one of the design drivers for spacecraft that rode on Pegasus. So why do we do that? What system engineering logic, what normal flow down of requirements and flow up of verifications will lead you to do such a stupid thing? 
Here's a reason. Those $40 million that we're going to spend were not all ours. Half of them were Hercules Aerospace. They were responsible for the design of the 48 inches and the 38 incher based on their pre previous experience and technology. But it was their money, their nickel, their design, their engineering. Had we had the logical two hooks here and one hook in the front, the load path that held the whole vehicle together would have gone from the hooks to the first stage, from the first stage to the second stage to the interstate joint, from the second stage to the front hook. And Hercules Service said, time out. That's too hard for us. Our experience has been in small tactical missiles that are carried under a single point and one rocket motor body holds entire loads. We know how to do that. Don't ask us to analyze, verify, and test the requirements associated with transferring the load through um, two of those. Were we the orbital today, and we were doing things that we had done today, what would have been our systems engineering reaction? Well, Hercules, tough. Go ahead and do it. You know, cost is no object, you're under a cost plus contract. You know that. <laughs> but that was not the case. We didn't have a lot of money. They were not under a firm fixed price contract. So we had to gulp and accept the suboptimal so here's an example of uh, systems engineering going beyond the pure numerical set of requirements flowing down and flowing up. Now, when we transferred the program oops, what I have done, to the Lockheed 1011, we said, well, now we know better. Hercules, don't worry about your responsibilities. You've already demonstrated. We already flown six times. And we added a third hook here. And we only use two of the four hooks in the back. Now, there's a very interesting trait that happens here, which is the timing of the release of the front hook with respect to the rear hooks is kind of touchy. If you happen to hit the right timing, and that timing is not just everybody at the same time, it has to do with how much Ener elastic energy is still stored on this thing, and what is the natural frequency of this vehicle as it flows, blah, 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 blah. If you time it right, you can reduce that twang significantly. If you don't time it right, you can double it. So it took a little bit of experimentation. There is this very complex mechanism going from the main hook release system here to the front that uh, is actually adjustable. You can adjust the, the delay, mechanical delay. Um, uh, and I think we hit it right because it seems to be working. So, um, this is a little bit of the examples of the um, systems engineering situation that happened during the development of uh, Pegasus. Mm, let me recap a few interesting items. Um, a small company started, a limited amount of money. Um, an interest that went beyond simply here's a set of specs. We, we realized that this was going to be our flagship vehicle. So there was a lot of representation. Uh, if we were successful here, we would be successful in other things. A very small team, 40 people. Now, sometimes it is argued that systems engineering is required for the same reason that uh, in software engineering, you tend to decompose a very large program into isolated items and erect abstraction barriers between the various elements. And that's how large software programs can be developed. There is a price to pay, however, which is you are setting up a number of interfaces between these various abstraction barriers. Because the idea, those abstraction barriers help you because you don't have to look inside the other compartment. If you're in compartment one, you don't have to look inside compartment two, so your job's a lot easier. On the other hand, what you lose is now the contract between compartment one and compartment two becomes a very critical contract. And you may spend an incredible amount of money and effort and risk following that contract when it probably would have been a lot cheaper, easier, faster, and risk-free had the compartment that you can't see changed 
what they do just a little bit. So that is the trade that we run every day in our jobs between taking advantage of compartmenting and being the victim of compartmenting. On Pegasus, we did not have that problem. There was one guy who was the systems engineer for the whole program, and that guy had the authority to say, well, it's too hard to put three hooks because Hercules won't play ball. Let's do it this way. But the most important thing is that there were a number of us that had situation awareness of the program, situation awareness of why we were doing this, situation awareness of what our real resource limitations were, situation awareness of how to bypass those issues and get the job done. At the same time, we did have the support of those who were in authority, and the financials were nobody interfered with us, and that's a luxury that not every program has. So these are some of my personal experiences. I'll be glad to open the floor to any questions that you may have or comments. Uh oh, I managed to uh, get them to sleep. <laughs> Yes, Karen. So you mentioned the four hooks, and um, I worked on HyperX, and we had fun with those four hooks as well. Um, was that a selection by Orbital to go to four hooks, or was that a previous design that you guys had to deal with? No, actually, the previous design was a three hook. Mm -hmm. It was the X-15. And we had to build this device called a pylon adapter to go from the X-15 pylon's three-point system, very nice, robust, long wheelbase, to this tiny thing. There's a little anecdote I'm going to share with you guys. Uh, we initially designed the pylon adapter using welded tubes. And as we look at the structural dynamics of this bouncing and rocking system, we realize that we require higher and higher stiffness from that pylon adapter. The way to do it, since we had very little depth to gain moment arm from, was to go to increasingly higher and higher heat treatments on the steel of the tubes to get the E, the modulus of elasticity that we wanted. As we did that, all sorts of horrible things happened. Um, wells popped out, the whole thing warped like potato chip. So I went to my friend and buddy, Berbertan, who, by the way, did design the structure and build the wing and fins for Pegasus. And we were driving from the Marie Calendars in Lancaster towards his shop in uh, Mojave. And in the car, one hour and 15 minute ride. We spec'd the product, we agreed on a schedule and a price, and we essentially shook hands on the contract. The, um, the project within Scale Composites was called the Pylon Adapter Now in Composites, or PANIC. <laughs> uh, he started the process by, instead of using fancy aerospace core to, to set the composite, he used um, uh, that, that stuff that uh, cheap furniture is made, it's not cheap furniture, uh, uh, particle board, thank you, particle board. Uh, he came in, instead of 28 days, he was delivered in 21, 22 days. It was the first structure, he said, that I've ever designed where I didn't have to worry about the weight. And if you guys go to Dryden, it's still in some bone yard somewhere, the old timers will point out to you, yeah, that's the Pegasus panel adapter. Oh, um, very good question. You're asking me about the dynamics of the evolution of the design. Uh, actually, uh, I didn't mention the second trade immediately after the idea of air launch. The second trade was which launch aircraft to use. And we looked at a variety of aircraft, but let me point out three that we looked in depth at. We did look at the B-52 because of the X-15 experience. We look at the Hercules because of uh, the version of the Hercules that carries this Ryan drones, a much smaller aircraft, a, also a wing carry like the B-52. The third aircraft we look at in detail was the SR-71. And in general, we look at the trade between small but fast release or slow release but bigger. The initial... The, let me backtrack one more piece of trivia. If you go to the Udvarhazy Museum on Route 28, the second largest artifact on the space wing of that museum is a Pegasus. 
It's a Pegasus XL, which is a bit longer than the original, but Pegasus nevertheless. What visitors to that wing of the museum don't realize is two uh, curious coincidences about the location of that artifact in that museum. Um, the idea for Air Launch, after having decided, as you pointed out, that we couldn't find a ride for our small messaging spacecraft. By the way, those of you who know the Orbcom constellation, that's what that initiative eventually morphed into. The idea came to me, according to somebody who was there, on April 8th, 1987, at an incredibly boring meeting that an organization called the Center for Technology Innovation, C Center for Innovative Technology, CIT of the Commonwealth of Massachusetts, that weird upside down building in the corner of 28 and the Access Road. In 87, they were trying to pull together a um, Center, a Center for Commercial Development of Space initiative sponsored by NASA with um, cooperation of industry and academia. Unfortunately, that meeting to which three of us attended representing Orbital was very poorly organized. The uh, people that were supposed to speak didn't arrive, the agenda was wrong, the timing was wrong. So we ended up sitting at a table very much like these tables here, bored to tears for a long time. Now, the previous year, the Air Force had shut down a perfectly functioning spacecraft with a small rocket launch from an F-15 that had barely enough oomph to get orbital altitude, and then just before it fell down to Earth, the spacecraft hit it. But nevertheless, it was an air launch orbit something. So I sketched on a piece of um, yellow ruled paper, not the back of the envelope, a kind of a poorly F-15 climbing and a little rocket, and then it was kind of an expanded view. Remember, in our world, we don't say exploded view, we say expanded view. Um, it carried small spacecraft. So I showed it to one of my two colleagues who raised his eyebrows and gave it to my other colleague who raised his eyebrows and we started talking about it. And we didn't realize that the meeting had started. We started talking about it. But then now we said, hey, why don't we get back to the office and talk with the big guy? So we stood up in the middle of the meeting and disappeared. And that meeting was at the hotel across from Route 28 from the entrance of the Woodbar Hazzy. So the germ of the idea for Pegasus occurred less than a mile geographically from where the artifact is. And 20 meters from the Pegasus is an F-15 launched interceptor rocket. So the, the product that had the, gave the idea to Pegasus is 20 meters away, and the location where the idea came was less than a mile away. But the initial thought was to use the Hercules. So the initial Pegasus, which, is, which was a much smaller vehicle than what you see today, it was about 8,000 pounds in weight, and we thought we had a, um, a payload capability of about 50, 50 pounds. Now, if you do the math associated with the sensitivity, the partial derivative of payload to structural mass fraction uncertainties and specific impulse uncertainties, you come to the inescapable conclusion that the smaller the vehicle, the higher the sensitivity. So your design is not very robust. You make a small mistake on your estimate of mass fraction, and kaboom, there goes your payload. Plus, that would have meant, even in the unlikely case that we would have hit those 50 pounds of payload, that we would have to essentially launch one satellite with one rocket. So the next thought was, well, how about if we go for 200 pounds of payload, so we could launch four, that's uh, not, okay, 400 pounds of payload, so we can launch eight. So from there, we had to kick out the um, Hercules. Um, the trade between speed and altitude, and one more thing, flight path angle, is still being revisited by some people today. Bert Rutan, before he retired, um, well, that's a different story. We have <laughs> That's how, and then within, I'd say that within three months of August 10th, uh, um, April 10th, 1987, it was this size, it was this diameter, it was three stages, it didn't have thrust vector control on the first stage, it uses the fins for dynamic control. 
Um, Originally, it had four fins rather than three. The three came about from ground clearance in the B-52. We didn't have a B-52 yet, but we knew we wanted to use that aircraft. So I'd say that within the first three months of a three-year project, by the way, the first flight was April 5th, 1990. So from that event in the, in the hotel to first flight, three days short of three years. I'd say that within the first three months, 90% 95% of the sizing and 80% of the design details, including the out, outer mold line of the wing and the outer mold line of the nose. Anybody thought as to why Pegasus has a rounded as opposed to biconical nose? Again, an our systems engineering trait. With a biconical nose, you get these strong attached um, shocks. So if you know what angle of attack you're going to fly at, you can design your Biconic to adapt to that. But Pegasus goes through these wild excursions, same as it goes through a range of Mach numbers, so you can't optimize the wing to any particular Mach number. Well, I was concerned about the shocks in the Biconic detaching at a particular set of, and then having these big upsets in pitch as the shocks attach and reattach. So what do you do? You put a smooth the nose as you can to try and make any shock shenanigans be more continuous than discrete. So uh, those items were all fixed within three months of the project. The time. <laughs> but uh, the, my question was uh, uh, not so much technical perspective the uh, Pegasus, but this group has been kind of, you know, we're, we're in a system engineering development program. <clears throat> and one of the aspects we've been toying around with is how does one grow and develop system engineers? So uh, as a company like Orbital, I mean, obviously you can go out to the organizations like NASA and et cetera and, and you, know, you know, obtain senior system engineers. But do you have any kind of training program in-house to develop your system engineering? We have a training program for the um, uh, functional elements, the systems engineering with big S and big E, the idea of your flow, how do you uh, define, identify requirements, flow down, the classical, you know, down and up V. We have uh, training modules um, that address that. But that does not address what I think is the most important systems engineering, the one with lowercase s, lowercase e. Um, uh, our approach to that has two components. First, we build satellites, we build geosatellites, LEO satellites, now human-rated spacecraft as the signal is. We build launch vehicles, air launch, ground launch, small, medium, now with Taurus II, solid and liquid. So we have a rather broad, and we build some electronics, some payloads, we have a broad range of products. Number two, our typical program cycle length is three years or less, unless, unlike, say, Sivers High, um, uh, you know, or, or Hubble, where, you know, somebody can make a career in, you know, the doctoral dissertation that started with um, the program, well, uh, the guy's retiring just before it launches. Um, we can afford two things that very few organizations can. We can hop people across programs and across disciplines and across types of products and so on with relative ease. And somebody within 10 years of working at Orbital has probably worked cradle to grave three programs. That's part of the, this is $29.95, this is $200, this is priceless. The experience of somebody within 10 years being able to cradle to grave three programs is our secret to systems engineering with lowercase as lowercase. I'm, I'm sorry, I don't have any magic bullets no, to offer. Sorry. Thank you. Okay. Uh, shall we get back to uh, real work? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs>